Well, good morning, everyone, and a very warm welcome to the Lord's House on a beautiful Lord's Day. We're glad to see you all, and uh, we've got the summer attire on and uh, the jackets off about half past eight every night last week. The jackets were on, the coats were on, the scarves, the gloves. It cooled down around about half past eight in the evening, quarter to nine. But we've had a blessed week, that's all we can say, a blessed week uh, in the tent mission, and the Lord has been so good to us. I touched the mic there, man. I don't know what happened. Maybe it should be all right. But uh, it was a blessed week, and uh, I know you've been working so hard, and you've been attending the meetings, and I'm sure you're weary. I'm sure you're tired, and you just need that touch from the Lord and that help even uh, for the next week. So we trust the Lord will be with us through today. Some have a very busy schedule. Uh, the Sunday school, the morning service, some have been at the prayer meeting, uh, the uh, afternoon for the open air, and then the tent mission. And then we have our young adults meeting as well. Uh, so we may be burning the midnight oil, uh, but nevertheless, we're working for the Lord and we trust the Lord will be with us and give us the physical, mental, emotional, spiritual strength that we all desire. So we're delighted to see you all and we welcome you in our Saviour's precious name. Also to those that are joining on the uh, live stream, we want to thank you for your faithfulness and we trust the Lord will be with you. He'll bless you and your family and whatever your need is today, we pray God will truly meet that need. We're going to worship the Lord by singing together the words of the hymn number 368. 368, for all the Lord hath done for me, I never will cease to praise him. We'll sing all of the hymn standing after the key as we sing. Let's all stand as we worship.
Lord. We'll still our hearts for a few moments and we'll seek the Lord's face in prayer. Father, we thank thee once again for the return of this, the Lord's Day. We thank thee for a sense of the divine presence. We thank thee for our Sunday school, our superintendent, the teachers, the students, the pupils. We thank thee, Lord, for their practicing for Children's Day. We thank thee for help given. We praise thee, Lord, for uh, these little lambs of the flock and for our young people. We thank thee for our young adults and the families of the congregation. We thank thee for our seniors. We rejoice, Lord, in all that thou hast been to us here in this fellowship. And we just lift our hearts in thanksgiving, Lord, with the very sentiments of this hymn before us. For all the Lord hath done for me. Lord, we can sing these hymns so lightly and never really reflect or meditate upon that little phrase, all the Lord has done for me. And Lord, we pray that we might be able to just now focus on the positive side of all that we have in Christ. Lord, oft times we're thinking of the enemy. We're thinking of problems and difficulties. We're thinking, Lord, of uh, little vexations of spirit. But Lord, we know procreated became living souls. We recognize that in thee we live, we move, we have our being. And thou art the thrice holy Jehovah God of heaven and earth, Adonai, the sovereign master of the nations. We bow before thy sovereignty. We worship thee in thy trinity. And we bless thee, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, for thou art God, thou art great, and thou art good. And Lord, you've been good to each one of us. It matters little whether we're saved or unsaved. We thank thee for the common grace of God. You've caused the sun to shine upon the just and the unjust, and the rain to fall upon nations that are atheistic and persecute thy church. And yet, Lord, you still favor the very creation with thy mercy. And we thank thee, thy heavens, Lord, drop mercy upon the earth. And right across the, the land, we see the goodness of God. Even though mankind has rebelled against thee in Adam, even though they're fallen creatures and they display in this world of defilement and danger. Lord, the rebellion and heinousness of sin. And yet you're so merciful and you're good and you're gracious and long-suffering to us, Lord. We think of ourselves, Lord, and what you've done for us. We thank thee, O God, for the salvation of God. We praise thee for the sending forth into this world of the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank thee, Lord Jesus Christ, for coming and dying upon the cross for our sins, for taking our place and being our substitute, for bearing in thine own body the awful, terrible punishment for sin, and enduring the wrath of God upon our sin when it was laid on thy sinless body. We think of the love that held thee to the tree. It was a love for a sinner like me. And we thank thee, Lord, for caring for us, Lord, for understanding, and Lord, for being able to show and have that quality of mercy. And we rejoice you've been long-suffering to us, Word. We realize we have many faults and failures. We confess it, O oh God, our sins, our backslidings, our coldness. Forgive us, Lord. We're glad you're a pardoning God. And who is a pardoning God like thee? And who has grace so rich and free? And how can we not forgive others when we have been forgiven such a great debt of sin? Lord, you've been kind to us, and we don't deserve it. It's one thing Thing, o God, to uh, even, Lord, be long-suffering with us, but then to show us kindness. Lord, we can hardly take it in uh, that you've been gracious to us, Lord. You're full of compassion, and you're the sympathizing Savior. Father, you're described in thy word as the Father of comfort and the God of all grace. You're the Father of mercies. Lord, we know that comfort originates from thee. You're the author of mercy, and we lift our hearts unto thee, 
And we can say, Lord, thy mercy endureth forever. And we thank thee, Lord, for thy compassions, as Jeremiah said, sitting amidst the ruins of Jerusalem. And how sad was his case. Lord, the tears like rivers flowed down his face. His heart was broken because of what happened to the people of God. And Lord, he lamented there in his book. And he sat amidst, amidst the ruins of Jerusalem and a people who were taken into captivity. And he could say in the eye of faith, looking to heaven, that thy compassions they feel not. Great is thy faithfulness. And we worship thee and we acknowledge thee. We thank thee, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We bless thee, Father, for the Comforter. And because Christ has suffered, bled, and died, and rose again, and ascended into heaven, he has sent forth the paraclete. We rejoice he has come. He will be with us and in us. He abides with us. We rejoice in the gift of the Holy Spirit. We thank thee for the one who is the Comforter, the one who reveals Christ to us, the one who shows us the way, the one who guides our path, the one who equips and empowers us to live the Christian life, and we're not left to ourselves to struggle. We thank thee there's such a thing as asking not only for forgiveness of sin, but the infilling of the Spirit, that we might walk in the Spirit, and the Spirit's power and might, that we might be enabled with a new dynamic uh, to live the Christian life, to say no to sin, the devil, the world, and temptation, and to go on with God and to work for the Lord. So bless us now. And remember, O oh God, we pray, uh, the week that's gone into eternity. Lord, we have to take time now just to thank thee for what you're doing and what you have done and will yet do. We thank thee for all who came into the meetings. We thank thee for help given. We thank thee for the workload of thy people, the commitment. We thank thee for their faithfulness. We thank thee, O oh God, for a sense of thy presence every single night. We thank thee, Lord, for dozens upon dozens of unsaved in the meetings. We thank thee, Lord, for salvation that visited the tent. We praise thee for new born babes in Christ and we pray you will lead them on with thyself and for others who attended and went out without the Savior. Lord, we pray that you'll go after them and bring them to repentance and faith. We thank thee for backsliders who were in and others, O oh God, who we believe have come back to the Lord. They may never say, but we thank thee, O oh God, we believe they've returned again to first love and for that we're truly thankful. And Lord, for thy blessing upon us, for help given. I have to ask thee, Lord, uh, I have to say, Lord, personally, I thank you for helping me as I've asked for help. I acknowledge it. I give thee praise and glory. And I pray, Lord, you will strengthen our hand for the incoming week. It's not how we start, but how we finish that will really count. Help us, Lord, to sacrifice the time and to give ourselves to God. So be with us as a congregation, as a fellowship in thy house, as a denomination, and many outside of it as well. Bless the faithful preaching of thy word. And again today, save the lost and restore Restore the backslider, revive the church, glorify thy son. And Lord, we're not unmindful today of some who are not able to get out to the house now. And for a long time, they've been shut in in their own home. And some are in nursing or residential care. Some are in hospital. And we commend them lovingly to God. We pray for our sister, Margaret Alexander. Be with Margaret, Lord, as she is in hospital at this time. Draw near to her. Remember Desmond and the family. We commend them lovingly to thee. Remember Norris Ritchie, Lord. You know all about Norris, Lord. And we just pray for him. And you know all about him, Lord. We just commit him to God and pray, Lord, you'll be with Norris. He belongs to thee. Undertake for him. Perfect that which concerns thy child. Remember, Lord Gladys McCartney, Lord in hospital, and Owen in the nursing home. Lord, you know all about them. We commend them to thee. Remember our sister Margaret McGee, Lord, home from hospital, but has a long way to go for recovery. We just commend her to God. Remember others who are awaiting surgery. Others, Lord, anticipating, Lord, even, Lord, treatment. We pray for our sister, our, our, uh, Sister congregations that have burdens, Lord, for their people as well in hospital and, Lord, going through surgery and others recovering. Remember, too, Stephanie Patterson today, Lord. We with Stephanie as she goes for treatment this week again. Lord, undertake for her and put thy hand upon her and undertake for her, we pray. And for many others, Lord, you know all about them. We commend the sorrowing and the sick to thee and commend them to God. So be with us now, Father, and grant to us as a body of thy people forgiveness of our sins, cleansing through the blood and the infilling of thy Holy Spirit with wisdom and with power. Hear our prayer today and Father glorify thy Son and the people of God said. 
Amen. Let's turn in our Bibles, please, to the book of Joshua, the chapter 24. I know some preachers and teachers over the years have spent long, long times in books of the Bible and character studies. Some have spent maybe two years in a single book. Um, I'm sure at the end of that book, the people are glad to see the end. I don't know. And I don't know how you feel about the study, but I believe that we prayed about it. The Lord directed the thoughts of myself to uh, study the life of Joshua. Uh, we're going to come to the closing chapter today, and most likely it will be the last message that I will preach here on the life of Joshua. So I just remind you uh, that in the will of God, we, we, we will uh, look for another series. We will look for another character study. We will look for a book of the Bible or a passage or a mini-series. We'll be looking for that, praying over the summer months, come into September, October, November, December, into the autumn and winter's work. And here's what I want you to do. It was a practice in my last church to do the same. And we always find the mind and will of God. As a congregation, uh, I would like you to give yourself to prayer. Now, I would ask you this. Don't put suggestions to me. Because if you do that, it makes it even more difficult. Because if someone says this and someone says that, uh, if there's 66 people say something, that's the entire Bible, <laughs> if they've got different thoughts. So I'd ask you please just to pray, and along with me, and we'll seek the Lord's face over the summer months. We'll, we'll earnestly seek after God. We'll find the mind and the will of God for preaching. And then when we come to the house, you'll know you've prayed. God has answered prayer, and we're in the book and we're at the person or at the passage or the theme or the subject that God has shut us into. And in that way, as a congregation, as a preacher, we're united. We have found the mind of God. We're in the will of God. That's the best way to preach, not just coming with messages and messages from anywhere, but to know God's mind and will. And in the interim, what I will give you is what the Lord gives me, either in my daily reading or in the place of prayer. Up until the Lord guides us, uh, maybe for September, and by that time we should know the mind and will of God. And when we do find it, believe me, uh, you will be blessed through the ministry of God's word. So we trust you will give yourself along with me to earnest prayer, and I promise you, and before God I assure you as your pastor, that I will give myself diligently to the Lord and to seek his face and to wait upon him and to be guided only by the Lord into what we should preach. But we're thankful for help given. I acknowledge it before the Lord now in the ministry on the life of Joshua. We're going to finish here in chapter 24. If you want to break in at the chapter then for the sake of time to verse 14. Joshua chapter 24, verse 14. Now we're talking about Joshua who is now old and stricken in years. He has many years. Joshua died when he was 110 years of age, and we reckon that he was close to that here. Uh, he wasn't a few years away from actually passing on. Uh, but he gives his final speech to now, not only to the leaders in verse 23, or sorry, chapter 23, but in 24, he gathers the people, and he's a heart for the congregation. And he gives them their father's serves that were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites, in whose land ye dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And the people answered and said, God forbid that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. For the Lord our God, he it is that brought us up and our fathers out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage, and which did those great signs in our sight and preserved us in all the way wherein we went and among all the people through whom we passed. And the Lord drave out from, from before us all the people, even the Amorites which dwell, who dwelt in the land. Therefore will we also serve the Lord, for he is our God. And Joshua said unto the people, Ye cannot serve the Lord, for he is an holy God. He is a jealous God. He will not forgive your transgressions nor your sins. If ye forsake the Lord and serve strange gods, then he will turn and do you hurt and consume you after that he hath done you good. And the people said unto Joshua, Nay, but we will serve the Lord. Amen. We'll end our reading there at the verse 
21, and we know the Lord will indeed bless the public reading of his own precious and infallible word. We're going to ask one of our elders, Mr. Colin McKee, please, if he'll come forward. He's going to make some necessary announcements. Thank you. Okay, well, it is good to see you in the Lord's house this lovely Lord's Day morning. Trust the Lord will speak to all of our hearts, challenge us even through his precious word and bless us today. Even those online, we do bid you even a special welcome also with us. Remember the open air this afternoon at 3 p.m. The venue this afternoon will be Laburnum. The bus will be leaving the church at 2.45. We encourage as many as possible to come out and stand with us. We have had good numbers out the last few weeks. And it's good even to come and even support even that work this afternoon. The mission continues tonight in the field. Remember the change of time at 6.30, the mission starts that. There will be a season of prayer in the wee porta cabin at 6 o'clock. We encourage as many as possible to come out even to that time of prayer and to pray for the meetings. Remember even how that the change of time is to facilitate families that you can come along and children can come even to the mission, and even experience the time, even in the tent there. The singers tonight will be the Walker Sisters. Remember, young adults, it's our last meeting of the season. It's at 8.45 p.m. in the tent. The speaker tonight will be uh, Adam Kennedy. He was here a few weeks ago. He's a student in the college. Again, we encourage our young adults all to come out and even to support the meeting tonight. And there will be supper served after the meeting even in the tent. The mission continues, God willing, this week, each night at 8 p.m. Remember, there'll be a season of prayer at 7.30 in the porta cabin. We have had great times of blessing. The Lord has answered prayer night by night. Souls have been saved. We give the Lord the glory even for all that he's done. But we look forward even this week, even to what the Lord is going to do. And even if you have invited people and as yet they haven't came, even go again. Even ring them or call them or go and see them and encourage them even to come out, even to the meetings. Remember, even ladies, we encourage you to wrap up warm. The tent is warm whenever you go in, but it does tend to cool down very quickly. So don't be afraid to put or bring a coat with you and even to keep yourself warm. Remember, even those online, remember that the services and the mission are broadcast on YouTube, not Facebook. It's just YouTube, even for the meetings in the tent. On Wednesday night, uh, there'll be a special season of prayer after the mission, and it'll take place in the porta cabin in the field. We encourage as many as possible to come even. You can only come for a wee while and then slip on, even as we pray for the, the meetings there. On Friday night, after the meeting in the tent, the tent must come down to facilitate a mission that is starting on the Lord's Day. We encourage as many as possible to stay behind to get the tent down and packed on the lorry. I've been assured that the tent will come down a lot quicker than it went up. Um, and I know the last time her brother Jackie brought us all fish suppers when the tent was nearly up. So it depends how we get on. If we end up having fish suppers, it'll not be good. If we make it for breakfast, it would be a lot better. So we encourage as many as possible, please, to stay and give us a hand even on that night to get the tent down. Next Lord's Day, the service is at 10.15 for the Sabbath school, 11.30 a.m. in the morning service in the open air at 3 p.m. Next Lord's Day, the tent will be down, so the mission will take place here in the church. We're going to stick to the mission time, so it'll be 6.30 here in the church for the service next Lord's Day evening. We're also having a special service of dedication for Paul and Ashley's baby Will uh, on that night as well. Team 6 will be on the supper that night, and we encourage all the ladies, if you could bring some sweet stuff, even that would be much appreciated. To our seniors, remember the seniors' outing. It's in Hillsborough Castle on the 16th of June. There's also wee booking forms here. You must take a booking form, fill it in, and bring it back to give it to David and Lorna. Uh, we're starting off in Hillsborough Castle and then Brownlow House for your lunch. So please get that filled in today, if possible, so that they can get even that organized. There's also some information from the Missionary Council. There's a prayer letter there in the hall. Please take one. And it tells what the work's going on, even in the mission field. And also, there's a booking form there also for a missionary weekend uh, later on in the year. We've also got a book on the table. It's this wee book here, The Lord is My Shepherd. Uh, Reverend Stanley Barnes did that book, and we encourage you to take one. There's seven pounds. There's a wee sheet there. 
Please put your name down and then see your, the treasure even at your convenience. We also want to announce that our Children's Day services will be on Sunday the 18th of June, 11.30 and 7 p.m. And our brother Chris Killen will be taking even the Children's Day services. On Friday night past at our presbytery, the Reverend Timothy Omerod accepted the call to be the minister of our Ballygown Church. It was ratified by presbytery. We would encourage you to pray for him. Pray for Ballygown and also Six Mile Cross. Even at this time, we look forward even to having fellowship together, even with her brother as he moves down, even to Ballygown. Thank you. He left my Bible this time. Thank you very much, Colin. He took my Bible the last time. <laughs> Mick just kept my eye on it. But uh, thank you very much to our brother Colin for those announcements. Subject as always to the divine will of the Lord. Maybe we could just bow in prayer and remember Ballygan and Six Mile Cross in our prayers. Loving Father, uh, we know that Christ is the sole king. He's the only head of the church. And why, Lord, man on earth will ratify the will of God. We thank thee for our brother Timothy. And we pray, Lord, as he has this transition from Six Mile Cross to Ballygan, that thou will make it easy for him. We pray that even in his ministry in the North Down area, that he will know much of the blessing of heaven. We pray you'll give to him the early and latter rain. Remember, Lord, Alex and the family. We pray, Lord, the young ones will be able to settle in in school and different things. We ask, Lord, too, for friendships that will form. And we pray, Lord, you will remember the work in Ballygan. Remember in Donica D, we pray too for Six Mile Cross, and they've lost their under-shepherd. And there's no doubt, Lord, there's perhaps even, Lord, discouragement. But we pray for them as a congregation that very soon you will call a man of thine own choosing, and that he will be sent of God to Six Mile Cross to minister. And we pray, Lord, that you will visit the ministry with blessing and revival, oversee the work there under the interim moderator, and grant, Lord, you'll keep your hand upon our works in these days. We commit our way to thee now and give thanks in Jesus' precious name. Amen. 490. Uh, this time we'll stand together as we worship. It'll not take us too long. We'll sing all of the, the hymn. Uh, I know there are six verses, but it doesn't take us too long to get through this hymn. 490, and we'll stand together, please, as we worship.
Amen. That's good singing. Do appreciate that. Joshua chapter 24 then. And with our Bibles open before us, we'll just take time and ask help of God in the hearing and in the preaching of the word. Father, we still our hearts once again. Lord, every step of the way, we desire to acknowledge the Lord. We're living in a world of confusion, and therefore we need truth. We're in a world, O oh God, that is defiled, and we need the word of truth. And Lord, we're living in a world that's damaged, and we need the comfort of thy truth. And we pray, Lord, you will minister to every single heart and mind and soul and spirit. We pray, Lord, whether they're listening online or present physically in the building, or will listen later on through the download or CD or DVD, we ask humbly and reverently, it will please thee to bless the word beyond the four walls of the church. Grant, Lord, it will not go over our head. We pray, Lord, it will not bounce off our hardened heart, but rather the word will find a resting place. It will find, find good ground prepared of God. To this end, Almighty God, prepare our hearts now. And like the household of Cornelius, we can say we are here present to hear what God the Lord shall say to us. And we can say, O God, too, like it was said there of Lydia, that the Lord opened her heart, that she was able to attend, uh, understand the things that were spoken. And we pray, O God, that there be no confusion, there be no complication of the word, there be no corrupting of the text. We pray, O God, that with clarity and plainness of speech, with sincerity of heart, and the mighty now infilling of the Holy Spirit of promise, thy word will go forth and have free course and be glorified in all of our hearts. To this end, Almighty God, I take the promised Holy Ghost. I take the power of Pentecost to fill me now to the uttermost, I take. But he undertakes for me and the people of God said, Amen. At this 24th chapter of the book of Joshua, we have what is known as the last words or final counsel of the leader of Israel. Joshua is coming now to uh, leave this present scene and to enter into glory. There's no doubt he has been a faithful individual. Uh, but soon after he literally in, uh, uh, counsels the entire nation as to their responsibility to love the Lord, to serve the Lord, to cleave unto God, that is, to stick to him like glue. Joshua now is about to leave this scene of time. There's no doubt anyone's passing is sad, but a leader like this, a charismatic figure like Joshua, but notice what it says there in the verse 26. Joshua wrote these words in the book of the law of God and took a great stone and set it up there under an oak that was by the sanctuary. And then he says, this stone shall be a witness to us for it has heard all the words of the Lord which he spake unto us. It shall therefore be a witness to you lest ye deny your God. So Joshua let the people depart every man to his inheritance. In verse 29, and it came to pass after these things that Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died, being a hundred and ten years old. How sad to see such a giant figure in Israel depart. Some of them had already witnessed the death of Moses. Some of them certainly had grieved. And many of them were alive, some of those young people and children and they would have known Moses in their early days, and no doubt they would have served under Joshua as well. And now he was about to depart, and who would take over from Joshua? We know that the elders that took over in that sense, uh, those, those that outlived Joshua, the people were faithful under them. But what, sadly, we have a summary in the book of Judges, what actually happened after Joshua died, after the elders passed away. The nation literally uh, went down into apostasy. Uh, they intermingled with the Amorites and the Canaanites in the land. And sadly, uh, they went far from God. And at every single time, God raised up a judge. That's why you've got what is known as the book of Judges. These are individuals who became, after Joshua, the leaders of the nation that was taken out of Egypt and brought into the promised land. And when Joshua passed away, 
He had left his final parting words. There's no doubt they resonated with the people. The response on this occasion was good, and they are to be commended. We often speak about the rebellion of the children of Israel. We often hear about their murmurings against God, their backslidings, their captivity. But on this occasion, we have to commend them because they listened to Joshua and his final parting words. He, he put them to the test. He even laid up a stone and he says, this stone will be a witness. This stone, and we know it's inanimate. This stone will hear your words. And before God, this stone will be a witness that you have said that you would serve the Lord. And if you do not serve the Lord, and if it seems evil unto you or unreasonable for you to serve the Lord. And remember, Joshua said, you cannot serve the Lord. In other words, the way you live and the things you say and do, God would never accept that. So you cannot serve the Lord the way you're living. You've got to change completely and you've got to be the Lord's and the Lord's only. And so Joshua lays down the rigors of discipleship. He says, if you're going to serve the Lord and follow the Lord, then you've got to love him and you've got to cleave to him and you've got to obey him and you've got to follow him. And you know, that's sometimes where many of God's people fall down. They're not willing to give their all to Christ. Somehow they feel their life would be ruined. If you read the book of Joshua and his final message to the people, you'll discover that he says, when you give your all to the Lord, that's when you find your life. You find it in doing his will. You lose your own life and you find it in doing his will. I believe he's a powerful example of faithfulness to the very last. Here's a man and he's no hypocrite. You can't say when Joshua was preaching here to the people and the people could say, well, listen, sure, for 10 years, you backslid Joshua. You're telling us to serve the Lord. You didn't serve. You're telling us to love the Lord. You didn't love him. You're saying to us, we must cleave to him. But for 10 years, Joshua, you were backslidden. You were cold at heart. You married the unsaved. You gathered things to yourself. And then you came back to the Lord. But that didn't happen. Joshua was faithful from his earliest days that you find him there in those early books of the, New, of the Old Testament. You'll discover that Joshua was faithful right up until he passed away at 110 years of age. And if now he's over the hundred, if now he's over the hundred, he's still able to say, even in old age, as for me, right now, and whatever age he is, he's over the hundred, as for me, and my house, we will serve the Lord. And if you're senior in this meeting house tonight or today, and if you're listening online and you feel somehow that your years of service are over, they're not. They're not over. I remember a man coming to our church in Lisburn, and he had a, a, a row with another church. And in that church, he left, and he was in his 70s. And he said to the Lord, because he was active and busy in that church and outreach and, and children's work. And he said to the Lord, my days are over. I'm finished. That's it. I'll never find anything else to do. I would say that's about maybe 15 years ago. And he started to look for a church and he couldn't find anywhere he could settle. And his wife says to him, have you, have you tried the free Presbyterians? See, that's what people do. They try. <laughs> they don't come. They try. Many don't like it. And he says, no, I haven't. He said these words to me. He says, I never even thought about the freeze. Never even came into my mind. And so he arrived and in the church and the churches that he had attended, they're all starting at about half past six. So he arrived before six o'clock and the gates weren't even open. And he went home and he says, what kind of church is that? They don't even have the gates open. And when he went home to his wife, his wife says, well, how's the meeting over so early? He says, I didn't even get in. The gates were closed. And she says, did you look at the notice board to see what time it started at? He says, no, I didn't. She says, we'll get back again. You know who the boss is there? And he went back again, and he came in. And when he came into that church, he said these words himself. He was present here today. He would tell you. He says, I knew this is the will of God for me. And I want to tell you something. He started outreach. It's still going to this day. They do outreach in the city of Lisburn two days a week. 
He formed a little group and they got the nickname Dad's Army. And you had to have literally a physical infirmity to join it. <laughs> the only two healthiest people, June and I, were the young people of it. But they were faithful. And he rediscovered service for God. And he was able to say, as for me and my house, even to this day, we will serve the Lord. And he's still there. And he's still doing outreach. And he still has a team. And he's still going out with gospel literature. And he's still working for the Lord. And that was some 15 years ago. And I want to tell you something. And, and even in senior years, you're still able to say, as for me, I'm not giving up. As for me, I'm getting out to the meetings. As for me, I'm going to be a man or woman of prayer. As for me, I'm going to help and whatever I can and whenever I can. And you can see that he is faithful to the very last. I wonder how we will finish. I wonder how we will enter the next world and meet the Lord. Certainly, I wouldn't want to be empty-handed. Whenever my wife and I were married, we have two texts of Scripture that we call our motto text for our marriage. The first one is Matthew 6 and 33, whereas we were told there that we are to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. And the other text is Joshua 24 and 15, and I have it on a big, huge piece of timber in my kitchen area. And it says, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. We had a fire guard, not the one that you put up with a real fire. Do you know one of those ones with a glass front and a wooden frame? And it sits in front of the fire and it's embroidered. You know one of those ones? And it said on it for years and years. We had it sitting there. We never lit the fire. And it says, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And any time any person asks me, and a young person, would you sign my book or sign my Bible? I generally put on the words, Matthew 6 and 33, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Joshua 24, 15, and those words, seek ye first the kingdom of God. I wonder how we will finish. Here's a man and he finished well. And maybe you have started well. And it's not how you start, it's how you finish. Many, many years ago, as you'd look at my physical frame now, I did a lot of running. I mean a lot of running. Miles upon miles upon miles across different places. And I run for days on end and for miles. But before I started the running, I was in the Territorial Army. And they said they needed a six-man team to do a cross-country. And I hadn't started running, but I learned from it. I hadn't started running, no interest in running. And they said we needed six men, and I didn't volunteer. In fact, they could only get five. They couldn't get a sixth man. And they begged me to run, and I didn't want to. And so I says, okay, I'll do it. And I never forget, there was a huge crowd gathered. And I was right at the front, right at the front, and they lined, it must have been 150 to 200 yards, just lined with people. And there were teams from the Territorial Army all in behind me. And I was at the front. And whenever they fired, fired the gun to start the race, remember, it was over six miles that I had to run. But I wasn't thinking. I was only thinking of 150 yards. And so I started, and I mean, as if I was doing the 100 meters I think even people stop to say, Where, what is he doing? What is he doing? And I had my moment of glory. And I run. And about, it could have been about 400 people, I don't know. We're all looking with our mouths open. Saying, does he know that he's six miles still to go? Well, I didn't even think. And when I got through the hole in the hedge when there was nobody there... I felt as if my lungs had just collapsed. And I literally mean that. I couldn't get a breath. And everybody was passing me. No doubt laughing. And my team said, more or less, we're only as good as our last man. We can't win this race until the last person crosses the line. So even if I had a finish first in a world record time and then was signed up for the British Olympics cross-country team, which was never going to happen, they were only as good as me. And I learned a lesson that day. I really mean this for life. It's not how you start. 
It's how you finish. The Christian life is not a sprint. It's a marathon. We pace ourselves. We work, we labor, we serve, we love, we fall, we get back up again. We discipline ourselves. We're undisciplined. We let the Lord down, but we renew our fellowship. We go on with God. We look to him. We learn from him. We pace ourselves. And that's what Joshua did. He was a wonderful example to the people. And I want to tell you, his parting words are an inspirational challenge, aren't they? To all of God's redeemed people. To wholehearted service for Christ. Service was the main and major theme of his dying remarks. He wasn't talking about me. He wasn't saying, now, I did this, you know, and I did that, you know, and I have done this. Now, you follow me, and I have left you a pattern and an example. Now, I want you to listen to me. I want you to do as I say. I want you to follow me. His sole interest was the people would follow the Lord, and they would go on with God. And, you know, down through the ages, uh, his remarks echo to the very church in every generation. Those words of verse 15, look at it yourself. Choose you this day whom ye will serve. And there's a choice going to be made today in this meeting house. You, child of God, will make a choice, or even those that are unsaved here, those that are listening, maybe cold at heart at home, and you're going to make a choice. You're going to choose this day who you will serve, whether Christ or the world, whether the Lord or yourself. You will either choose Christ and follow him, or you will walk away from him, or you will be at a distance from him. You will choose not to serve him, or you will choose to serve him. And Joshua is more or less saying, after I've delivered my challenge to you, I'm not really worried now what you do. As for me, this is my concern. My concern is not someone else. Do you remember what Peter said in John 21? And I'm going by my, my memory here. Do you remember what Peter said in John 21? He looked at the Lord and he looked at John. And he said to the Lord, I paraphrase, Lord, what's your will for this man? What's this man going to do, Lord? What are you going to do with him? Because they thought that the Lord was telling John was going to be a martyr and he would die in a certain way. And then Peter got involved and he poked his nose into someone else's business. And he tried to find out what the will of God was for someone else. And he says, what will this man do, Lord? What are you going to do with his life? Tell us, Lord, what is going to happen to John. And you know what the Lord said? And I told you, I'm paraphrasing here. Here's what the Lord said to Peter. Peter! Never you mind what I'm going to do with John. For that's none of your business. That's what the Lord actually said. Peter, never you mind about my will for someone else. Your business is to know the will of God for yourself. And here's what he says. Peter, follow thy me. Keep your eyes on me. Don't be poking your nose into the business of others. Well, Joshua was very like Christ, wasn't he? Because he says, here's what you need to do, but as for me, I'm going to follow the Lord. I'm going to serve the Lord. I want you to think as we close on that theme, that major thought of service here in Joshua 24. And I want you to think whenever you consider the words of Joshua, first of all, he gives to us the motive for this service. Notice what he says in verses 13 and 14. Look what he says there, the motive for this service. Now therefore fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and truth and put away the gods which your father served on the other side of the flood and in Egypt and serve ye the Lord. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve. I want to tell you something that the Lord lays down for us the ground rules here in verses 14 and 15. Joshua's address to the people in this 24th chapter is what is known as a God-honoring rehearsal of their glorious history. We didn't take time, by the way, to read the entire chapter. But if we did, we'd have been reading from verse 1. And you'd have found before you got to verse 14 that 1 to 13 is nothing else but a summary of the history of the goodness of God to his people. So what we have in this 24th chapter is a glorious rehearsal, a God-honoring, Christ-centered rehearsal of the glorious history of the grace and mercy of God that they had received. They were to consider the great things the Lord had done for them. 
It was calculated before he challenged them to service. It was calculated to strengthen their faith. It was to enlarge their sense of indebtedness to and responsibility before the Lord. He could not have challenged them. He could not have inspired them or encouraged them or exhorted them. He could not have motivated them until first he rehearsed the great things the Lord had done for his people. I want to tell you something. That's the greatest motivation. That's how we're driven to serve the Lord, when we have a sense of our indebtedness to God. Did you ever hear the words of Christ preached on or even read in your Bible, those words in the Bible in the New Testament, that he that is forgiven much loveth much? Have you ever heard that? I guarantee you there's not a child of God here that you wouldn't raise your hand now and say, yes, I've read that, I've heard that. You maybe even have heard a sermon preached on it. He that is forgiven much loveth much. But I want to tell you something. Quite often it's taken out of context. Completely out of context. And people would say, well, you preacher... You love the, more, the Lord more than someone who's been saved as a child because your sin has been bigger and you have more sin than that child has ever sinned. And therefore, he that's forgiven much loveth much. And that's why someone brought up in the church, a young person, they make a profession of faith. They don't go to prayer meetings. They don't do outreach. They don't serve the Lord the way they should. Oh, they're saved, but... They haven't been saved from the amount of sin that you preacher have committed. Can I tell you something? That is not the meaning of that verse. It is not. I'm going to tell you the meaning of that verse. I'm going to give you the teaching of Holy Scripture and what Christ actually meant by that verse. And we're before the Lord now who spoke that word. It's nothing to do with the amount of your sin. That is wrong. Nothing whatsoever to do with the amount of sin you've committed and the amount of sin God has forgiven. It's nothing to do with it. If you only had committed one sin, that one sin is damnable and would damn your soul in hell. That one sin, that's right, that one single sin, you would lose your soul, you would suffer eternally in hell for that one sin. And what the Lord was speaking about was this. He that is forgiven much. It simply means they realize no matter the amount of their sins, they've been forgiven and saved from an eternal hell. It's nothing to do with the amount of your sin or how good or bad a sinner you've been. It's to do with the fact that God has forgiven a sin that would have damned your soul in hell. And you would have been in a lost eternity. And you'd have been there now, but for the grace of God. And you'll be there forever, but for the grace of God. That's what it means. So it's a nonsense to think that someone who has been wicked and they get saved, they love the Lord more. That is not true. What we're dealing with here is a sense of indebtedness. Whether you've been a child and saved, or a young person and saved, or a church-going person and saved, or a moral person and saved. It's the sense that one sin would have damned me in hell, and the Lord has saved me from hell. And I'm indebted to him for all eternity. And I love him because he has forgiven me much. He has pardoned the sin that would have damned my soul in hell for all eternity. You've got to think of that. And that's what the Lord meant there when he was teaching the people. And child of God, listen to me. You are not required to love the Lord less because you were saved as a child. You're not required or responsible to love the Lord less because you were saved as a young person. And because you walk the clean side of the broad road that leads to where? Hell! Were you a sinner? Were you on the road that leads to destruction? Of course you were. And the Lord has forgiven your sin. 
It doesn't matter how bad you've been or good. It doesn't matter how filthy your life has been or how wicked. Sin is sin is sin. And all sin is damnable in hell. And God has forgiven a massive debt and pardoned and paid for it for you. Any wonder the Lord demands one thing of you. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart. And he that is forgiven much, and you have been, young person, boy or girl, saved by God's grace, you have been forgiven much. A great debt has been cancelled out. Christ has taken your place, endured your hell, suffered your torment for your sins. And it doesn't matter how many they've been, each one de deserving of hell. And therefore you are to love much. And that's basically what the theme here of service is. He outlines what the Lord has done for his people. And then he says, now here's your responsibility. You're obligated now to serve him. It's calculated to strengthen your faith and to enlarge your sense of indebtedness to and responsibility before the Lord. Forgiven much, you love much. And in reviewing the history of Israel, Joshua emphasizes all the Lord has done for him. Can I say something to you? You can take time today to do it if you want. From verses 1 through 13, the personal pronoun of the Lord, I. The personal pronoun of the Lord, using I, God speaking, I. He uses it, that word, uh, some, uh, the personal pro pronoun. In fact, tell you the truth. The Lord uses it so much that it becomes as if the Lord now is highlighting to his people, as if they're not listening. And the Lord begins to say literally, I did this for you. I did that for you. It's used so many times here in verses 1 through 13. Used so many times that you'll discover that the Lord's now saying to them, look at what I have done. Get your eyes on me. I have done this for you. I have done that for you. Their history was nothing else but sovereign grace. Sovereign grace. And even in the book of Deuteronomy, we haven't time to go there. It even tells us about that grace. Notice what it says there in verse 13, because that would summarize the book of Deuteronomy. Look at chapter 24 and verse 13. Look what the Lord says, And I have given you a land for which ye did not labor. You did not labor in this land. I gave it to you freely. And cities which ye did not build, and ye dwelt in them of vineyards and olive yards which ye planted, and yet you, you do eat. Can you see that? It's all of grace. I give you this land and you didn't labor in it. You didn't build those cities, but I gave them to you. Built and all. See those olive yards? You never had to plant and wait for 10 years before you got the crop. I've given them to you, planted and all. And those vineyards, I've given you them all. And I want to tell you something. It's designed to show the people of God. And Joshua now finishes summarizing the history of God's faithfulness to his people. And he goes on to exhort them to work for the Lord, verses 14 through to 21. And you know, there are 14, you can count them, 14 exhortations to serve in verses 14 through to 22. The word serve here, by the way, is not, it is not the usual word for serve you'll find in the Old Testament. Can I say to you that this word serve all 14 times is translated in the same way. And it's the word work. Now I mean this. You can literally put in the word work. For that's what it means. Elsewhere it's translated serve in your Hebrew Bible. In the Old Testament. But in Joshua 24. The 13 references in verses 14 to 22. All uh, 13 references or 14 references. All of them literally are translated the word work. And you've got it like this. Work for the Lord. Work for the Lord. Work for the Lord. It's even translated three times like this. Work only for the Lord. Now there's application there that you wouldn't like. There's application there that would radically change your life. It would. Work for the Lord. 
work only for the Lord. That's the message of the Old Testament to the people of God. And it's the message to believers today. Work for the Lord, yes. But without that little word coming in only. You would then say, I'll work for the Lord and I'll do everything else for myself. I'll work for the Lord. Are they doing that? Don't I go to church? That's enough. But it doesn't say that. These 14 times the word work is used. The word serve, it's work. And then it's work, work, work. But on three occasions, on three occasions, it's work only for the Lord. Now what does that say to us? I want to tell you something. The application to that, some would not like it. It would be radical and life-changing for you. If you were to work only for the Lord. Only for the Lord. That means putting your own interests aside. What about next week in the mission? Work for the Lord. Come out tonight and forget about the rest of the time. That's not what the Bible teaches. Work only for the Lord. To get out every night would be a wonderful thing. It may not be possible. There are works of necessity and mercy. There are examinations young people are going through. There are commitments at home to elderly people. There's sickness. We understand all of that. We understand all of that. No one would expect any person who was unwell to attend a meeting. No one would ever expect to neglect your children or your elderly parents to get out to a meeting. No one's saying that. No one would say to you that you have a work of necessity and mercy. You must give it up and you must work only for the Lord. No one would ever say that. So don't think that. And don't think we mean that. We understand. But we're possible. Where it's actually possible. Where you actually have a choice. Give the week to the Lord. Work for the Lord. No. Work only. Only this week for the Lord. And then after that, you'll see the joy of service and working for the Lord. Not only do we see the motive for this service, but I want to move on very, very quickly. But notice the manner of this service. Look at verse 14. It tells us there, only fear the Lord in sincerity, or now therefore fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in truth. Here's the very manner of your service. Is it very interesting to think that in verse 15, notice in verse 15, it says, if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord. Now, how would it seem evil to a believer to serve the Lord? The word evil here doesn't mean it's a wicked thing. That to serve the Lord would be a sin. It doesn't. The word evil here literally means if it seem evil unto you, if it seems an unreasonable thing for you to put the Lord first. And many of God's people feel like that. They feel it's unreasonable. It's unreasonable to ask the Lord, for the Lord to expect me to read my Bible every day. Oh, come on. I have a busy life, you know. And then to take time out to pray. Do you not know how busy I am? Do you not know the things that I do? Do you not know the involvement I have with other things and the commitment that I have? You mean to say live a holy life and and live a clean and a pure life? If it's unreasonable to you, if it seems an evil thing, as if it's just totally unreasonable, then here's what Joshua says. Well, go then and serve something else. Go ahead. Go and serve your sin. Go and serve your flesh. Go and serve the devil. Go and serve the world if you want. Joshua's not going to stop you. He's not going to make you. He says, choose you. But as for me, I've my mind made up. I know what I'm for doing. But what about you? That's what he's saying. And if you think the standard is too high for serving the Lord and loving the Lord with all of your heart, then find someone else and something else to love. That's what he says. The Lord will not sit and mope with his arms folded and his face crossed, shaking his head and saying, those people won't serve me. No, he'll not. No, he will not. And he will never be held to ransom by me. With or without me, his work will be done. And if the Lord doesn't use you, he'll use me. And if he doesn't use me because I think it's unreasonable and the standard is too high and I'm unwilling and it's like an evil thing to serve the Lord, and here's what the Lord says. Well, I'll use someone else. I'll find a Joshua and I'll find a house. I'll find a, a, an individual who'll say, as for me, 
And I'll find a house who will say along with him, we will serve the Lord. The Lord will always help people. He'll always help his workers. But on that day at the Bema, our works will either be tried with fire and be found, silver, gold, precious stones, or wood, hay, and stubble, saved by the skin of our teeth. Empty-handed, I tell you something, the most fearful thing. What do I fear? What do I fear on earth? I tell you what I fear. Yes, I fear God. There's one thing I fear is this. Meeting the Lord empty-handed with nothing to show from a life that's been saved by sovereign grace. And the manner of this service that the Lord expects is this. Fear the Lord. I hear people criticizing those words and say, huh, you don't fear God. You're afraid of God. You're, you've got this dread of the Almighty. That's not what the word fear means at all. So whoever says that, and they have said it, they haven't a clue what the word fear in the Bible means, especially when it's related to a believer. The word fear is to revere. It's like a child, and it wouldn't do something because it knows that it would be wrong and it would hurt their mum and dad. Not all young people are like that, by the way. But there are some and they would say, no, I'm not going to do that because I know my mum wouldn't be pleased. And I would hurt my mum. And I would hurt my dad. Well, that's actually the word fear when it's used of the child of God in Scripture. That's what it means. It means to love. It means to revere and to serve with reverence. It's as though you say, no, I couldn't hurt that person. If someone had come along to you and someone says, listen, I hear you're in great financial trouble. Now, here's what I'm going to do for you. Give me your bank account and your short code and your account number. I'm going to transfer funds into your account. Now, listen to me. I don't want anybody to know this. I don't want you to tell your family where it came from. All I want you to do is this. I want you to receive it as a love gift from me. And let's say, I'm just saying this. Let's say it was a figure in hundreds of thousands of pounds. And suddenly your bank account now was healthy and your debts were paid off and you had money in the bank. And then whenever you meet someone and they begin to ridicule that person that helped you, you'll not join in with them. You'll have a respect. You wouldn't want them to find out that you gossip behind their back. You wouldn't want them to know that you put them down. You wouldn't want them to know that you murmured and complained and you brought them down and you told lies about them and you listened and spread rumors about them. No, you would have this fear, this reverence, this love, this respect, this sense of debt to that person that would restrain you from doing that, that would stop you from hurting that person, grieving and offending that person. Well, that's exactly the word that's used here. Fear the Lord. It means it's a fear of hurting the one who loves us and gave himself for us on the cross. It's a dread of offending the one who cares for us, keeps us and provides for us every day. You, you know what it's like? They say you don't bite the hand that feeds you. And sometimes you can feed an animal and if you were feeding a dog and you were very kind to it, you're really kind. And for six months you gave it little treats and it came and it licked your hand and it got the little treat. And then suddenly one day you handed it out and it, you, the dog took it and then it bit you and broke your skin. And that's exactly what it's like when we offend the Lord. It's like biting the hand that feeds us. Fear the Lord, that is, serve him with reverence and love and respect. And dread, have a dread that you don't want to hurt the Lord. You don't want to grieve the Lord. You don't want to offend the Lord. Does this hurt the Lord? I'm not doing it. Does this grieve the Lord? I'm not doing it. Do you see that? That's how you serve. That's how you work for the Lord. You fear. And then it says insincerity. You know what that word means? Entire or fully. It doesn't mean that you're sincere in that sense that we have. It's just lightheartedly. This here means to... Be entire and fully the Lord's. Serve him with integrity, yes. Without blemish, complete, full, yeah. Really means with all the heart. And then in truth, notice it says there in verse 14, serve him in fear, sincerity, and in truth. You know what the word truth here means? Stability, faithfully. Serve him truly. Serve him with an honest heart all the time. We are to serve Christ and do what is good and right. There's one final thought, and it's this. You have the moment for this service. Notice what it says in verse 15, and we'll finish here. If it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day. Here's the moment 
for service. You have the motive and the manner of this service. Now you have the moment. Look what it says. This day whom ye will serve. Choose you this day. I close now and finish now. The Lord will never force you or me to serve him. While he commands it and demands it, he will never coerce. He will never force you to serve him. That's why a minister and a session cannot make people serve the Lord. We can't force you to be at the mission. We can't force you to be in the meetings. We can't coerce you to go in to the prayer meeting. But what we can do, what Joshua did, we can tell you what the Lord has done for you. We can show you by our own example the best way to work for God. And we can even give you the manner from Scripture with fear and sincerity and in truth with all the heart and the Lord only. But at the end of the day, it's up to you now. And that's what Joshua says. And as I finish this series now, right now, as I close my notes, as we close the book, as we say farewell for a little season to Joshua and his life, let Joshua have the last say. Choose you this day whom ye will serve. Do the right thing. Serve the Lord. And if you're not saved, choose you this day to serve Christ and come as a sinner to, to the Lord. Father in heaven, it is with thanksgiving we praise thee for thy word. We thank thee for this series in the life of Joshua. We thank thee for giving help, and I acknowledge it publicly. I've cried to thee for months, Lord, for help in the study. I've cried to thee. I've looked at difficult passages. You've helped us through it. I've cried to thee for power to preach. I've cried to thee for blessing through the word. Lord, you've answered this and much more beside. We want to acknowledge it now in closing, to give thee thanks, to praise thee, and to give... Lord, glory to thy name. So bless these parting words of Joshua to all our hearts that we may work for the Lord only. We offer this our prayer, giving thanks in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Thanks for your attention. May God richly bless you today.